chapter 10, we're going to look at the muscular system. We'll talk a little bit about physiology, but we're mostly going to talk about how to identify all these muscles. So, the thing that we should know about muscles is that muscles always pull, they never push. And they've got two attachment places. What is what's called an origin and an insertion. In general, our origin is the less movable attachment. And when the muscle contracts, we're going to pull the insertion toward the origin. Our insertion then is our more movable attachment. Origins and insertions aren't always easy to find. Okay, so an agonist in the movement is the prime mover. It's going to be most responsible for a particular movement. A good example is the biceps brachii, which is the agonist in arm flexion. We always have a muscle that is going to undo what the agonist does. That's called the antagonist. So our antagonist opposes the prime mover or opposes our agonist. You can say it does the opposite. So in the example of our biceps brachii being the agonist in arm flexion, our triceps brachii is the antagonist to that movement. It undoes it. Okay, so if our agonist in arm flexion is the biceps brachii and our antagonist is the triceps brachii, well, what about their roles in the opposite movement? The triceps would be the agonist in arm extension and the biceps would be the antagonist. So what's an agonist in one movement is an antagonist in, in another movement. Can, does that kind of make sense? Can you see that? So what one does is we have another muscle that opposes that and does the opposite, but that doesn't mean it's always an antagonist. It will be the agonist for, like, our, the triceps is the agonist for arm extension. Then we have muscles that we call synergists. Synergists assist the prime mover in some way. So they're going to help the prime mover. Keeping biceps uh, or arm flexion as our movement, then a synergist would be your brachialis. It helps. And then we've got specific types of synergists called fixators. And fixators stabilize a joint so that you can perform the movement. So a fixator is a synergist because it's assisting the prime mover, but it's specifically holding a jo another joint still. So we'll say it's a synergist that stabilizes a joint. And in this example of the prime movement that we're talking about being flexion of your arm, then a synergist to that could be your delta, or a, sorry, a fixator to that could be your deltoid. And this makes sense if you think about um, curling 50 pounds. So if the prime move is to flex that 50 pounds, then we really have to stabilize that glenohumeral joint so that the only thing that's moving is your arm lifting that 50 pounds. So your deltoid fixates that joint. It keeps your glenohumeral joint stable so that you can do this movement. All right, so then some generalities that we can use to figure out what muscles are doing or what movement they're helping. We can say in general, a muscle that crosses the anterior side of a joint produces flexion. So we can see that your biceps are on the anterior uh, and they produce flexion. Some of these generalities don't apply to like the knee and the ankle. The lower limb, the lower limb is rotated, so it's kind of opposite. Um, and also when you bend those joints, you can get a little more movement. So if you look at the anterior compartment of your arm, all of those muscles are flexors. The posterior compartment of your leg, those muscles are flexors. So then also another generality, a, posterior, a muscle that crosses the posterior side of the joint produces extension. 
Again, this is going to be different in the leg. So we could say posterior arm and anterior leg produce extension. Okay? A muscle that crosses on the lateral side of the joint produces abduction. So your deltoid abducts your arm. And a muscle that crosses the medial side of your leg produces adduction. Or sorry, the medial side of a joint produces adduction. Next we're going to talk about the rules for naming skeletal muscles. I'm not going to write them down, I'm just going to talk about them. So we can name skeletal muscles based on their location. So biceps brachii, found in the brachial region. Biceps femoris, one your hamstrings, found in the femoral region. So that's the first thing. Uh, temporalis, found here above your temporal bone. So we can name muscles based on location. We can also name them based on shape. Deltoid refers to triangle. This is kind of a triangularly shaped muscle. Trapezius is a trapezoid shape. Uh, you don't have to know rhomboidius, but this muscle right here looks like a rhomboid, and this is rhomboidius major. So we can name them based on their shape. Then we also name them based on size. So I will write down about our sizes. Uh, so we can have like our adductor longus, and the opposite of that would be brevis. So if you've got two, longus is the longer, brevis is shorter, gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. Maximus is biggest. Medius is like an intermediate size or middle size. Minimus is the smallest. <coughs> we also say um, Magnus for like wide. So we'll see we've got an adductor Magnus and an adductor Longus. So Magnus is wide. Then we can also name them based on the direction of our muscle fibers or muscle fascicles. So we're going to look at the specific ways that this happens. Um, first, circular. In a circular muscle, our muscle fibers are arranged in a circular fashion. So examples would be like this circular muscle around your eye. It's called the orbicularis oculi. And we also have the orbicularis oris. So circular tend to be called orbicularis. We can also find muscles where the fibers or fascicles run parallel to each other. An exa a good example of that would be your rectus abdominis here in the front of your abdominal wall. So parallel is just like it sounds. Our muscle fibers are running parallel to each other. Convergent is when we have muscle fibers that start out spreading across a long area uh, or a wide area and then converge and meet at one single point. So for convergent, we can say our fibers are spread out over an area but converge on one single point. A good example of that is pectoralis major, here in the front of your thorax. So it's spread out across your uh, mammary region here, and then converges at one single point right here. So that's an example of a convergent muscle. And then we have pennate muscles. Pennate muscles kind of look like feathers. And what pennate muscles have is they've got their muscle fibers coming at a tendon to or coming to a tendon at an angle. So they look like feathers. And we'll say that our fibers, our muscle fibers, approach a tendon at an angle. We've got different types of pennate muscles. 
Unipennant muscles, an example here, extend your digitorum longus is a unipennant muscle. The fibers are approaching the tendon from one angle. A bipennate muscle, a good example, would be rectus femoris here in the front of your leg. Our muscle fibers are approaching the tendon from two different angles. Then we have what's called multipennate, and this is like our deltoid. The muscle fibers are approaching this tendon from many different angles. So we've got two angles here, two angles here, one angle here, lots of different angles. It's multipennate. All right, the next way we can name it is based on number of origins. So your biceps brachii has two origins. Your triceps brachii has three origins. We can also name them based on their attachment locations. So what are their attachments? Their origins and insertions. So that counts as one thing. Our attachment location would be like your sternocleidomastoid is this muscle of your neck that attaches to your sternum, the manubrium of your sternum, to your clavicle, that's the clido part, and back to your mastoid process. So it's the sternocleidomastoid. So it's being named based on the attachment location. Then we can also name based on muscle action. Rectus femoris keeps you erect. Rectus abdominis keeps you erect. Uh, adductor longus, adductor magnus, they're adductor muscles. So we can name them based on action. Then the last thing we're going to talk about before we start looking at specific muscles are lever systems. And this is what's being created as our muscles pull on our bones. And in the lever system, the lever is a rigid bar, in this case a bone, that a force is applied to, uh, and it's going to move about a point called a fulcrum. So, for lever we can say this is a rigid bar that rotates around a fulcrum. And in this case, it's a bone that we're talking about. And our fulcrum in this case is going to be some kind of joint. So um, our bone is going to move around a joint. Other parts of the lever system are what's called the effort and the load. And the effort is the force that we're applying to the lever to move the load. And in this case then, that is the force of muscle contraction. So the effort is the force applied to the lever to move what we'll call resistance. The resistance is our load that we're going to move, and the force applied to the lever is our muscle contraction. And our load is the resistance that has to be moved by the effort. So this is, this is your um, bone, your skeletal muscle, and whatever it's moving. That we have, what's, where we can either work at a mechan mechanical advantage or a mechanical disadvantage. So in a mechanical adva advantage, you are able to move a heavy load with a little bit of effort. And you're able to do this because our effort and our load are very close together. So when you're working at a mechanical advantage, we can say our load is close to the effort. And this will allow you to move a uh, large load with little effort. You can also work at a mechanical uh, disadvantage. And what happens in a, de in a disadvantage is that our load is far away from our fulcrum. And our effort is close to the fulcrum. So we can't move as much, but we can do it faster. So. Our effort's not far either, but our fulcrum is closer. Whereas the mechanical disadvantage, our effort is far from our fulcrum. So 
So we can move quickly, but not as much. Uh, but not as, not as big of a load. So if we're working with a mechanical, a mechanical advantage, our effort is close to our fulcrum, which is close to our load. And in a mechanical disadvantage, our fulcrum is far from our load, our effort is between. This gives us speed, but not as much strength. So we have three different classes of levers. In our first class le lever, our fulcrum is found between our load and our effort. An example out in the real world that we use would be scissors. In the first class lever, our effort is between uh, our fulcrum, sorry, is between our effort and our load. An example would be scissors. An example in your body would be like when you pull your head back. So in the first class, our fulcrum is between our effort and our load. In our second class levers, our load is between our fulcrum and the effort. An example out in the real world would be a barrel, a wheelbarrow, where we've got our fulcrum, our pivot point at the end. Our load, it, that we, the work that we have to do is in between, and the effort is applied to the opposite end. An example of that in your foot would be when you stand on tiptoes. Your fulcrum, or the pivot point, is that metaphalangeal phalangeal joint. The load is the weight of your body bearing down, and the effort is that contraction produced by your gastrocnemius and soleus. And in the third class, lever, our effort is applied between the load and the fulcrum. So an example out in the real world would be like tweezers. You apply effort to the middle, your pivot point is at one end, and your load's at the opposite end. An example in the body is that bicep curl you're doing. Your fulcrum would be the joint between your ova and your humerus. The load that you're overcoming is the uh, dumbbell in your hand, and the effort is being applied by the biceps brachii. 